It is indeed my pleasure to introduce to you a good friend, a long-time friend. When I say long-time, it does not mean that I am old, but we have been friends for about 30 years. And it is indeed my pleasure to introduce to you this evening my comrade and friend, mentor, Frendel Jerome Stewart. The Right Honorable Frendel Jerome Stewart, former Prime Minister of Barbados, was born on the 27th of April in the 1950s, 1951 to be exact, <laughs> at March Field in St. Philip, and that was where he spent all his life basically until recently when he moved to his current location. He was educated at the St. Mark's Primary and the Christchurch Foundation, a former teacher of the Princess Margaret Secondary School where he taught, I believe, history and Spanish before moving on to read for his bachelor's in law at the University of the West Indies, Cave Hill Campus. He then went on to the Hugh Wooden Law School in Trinidad and Tobago to complete his legal education certificate. I was first introduced to this outstanding Barbadian in 1994 when he entered elective politics contesting the seat of St. Philip South for the Democratic Labour Party. I walked the length and breadth of that constituency along with Algernon and Adderley, with my comrade. And my support was not in vain because he was successful in the 1994 general election. However, the party did not win that election. But the, so despite winning his seat, he had to go into the parliament on the opposition benches. In 1999, he lost the St. Philip South seat, but the party was able to regain some momentum and he moved on to St. Michael South. It took him another nine years of hard work in St. Michael South before he entered the lower house again. By 2003, however, Erskine Sandiford, as he was then, gave way to him, but again he failed to capture the seat and was made a DLP senator between 2003 and 2008. After doing a fantastic job in the Senate of Barbados, he was then returned to the House of Assembly in January 2008. By that time, he had caught the imagination of the residents of Bayland, Dalkeith, Reese Road, Culloden Road, parts of Bonnets, and surrounding areas. He was a remarkable team player in the 2008 election campaign and provided the type of leadership that David Thompson needed and was sworn in as his deputy prime minister after our election victory. He served this country as its attorney general under the late David Thompson, and he became prime minister on October 23rd, 2010, on the untimely passing of the then prime minister. Much more can be said about Comrade Frondel Stewart, but time does not permit. He has been a member of this party for over 50 years, and is one of the few with the institutional knowledge this party needs if it is to get back to its roots. We must not be afraid to, to utilize the intellectual capacity of this humble but great Barbadian. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed my pleasure once again to have been asked to introduce my friend and my mentor, former Prime Minister of Barbados, Frandel Jerome Stewart to address you on the topic, the meaning and purpose of the Democratic Labour Party in the politics of Barbados. Comrades and friends, sympathizers and supporters, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Right Honorable Frandel Jerome Stewart. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman.
very pleased to be here this evening at the St. Michael's South East branch meeting. I believe I was here sometime in February last year and was supposed to be here again in April this year, but that assignment was cheated of fulfillment <laughs> by the now historic quarterly meeting, quarterly report meeting of the party, which has led to so much of the confusion in which the party has been engulfed ever since then. And when I was supposed to come here in April, I decided that based on all that I had been seeing and hearing in and around the party, that it was necessary to remind the party that we had a history, a tradition, and a stewardship to defend in Barbados, and that the internecine warfare, which was crystallizing around that time, was not in keeping with the highest traditions of the Democratic Labour Party. I didn't get a chance to say it then, and of course, things got horribly worse until we are now where we are. But as they say, better late than never. So I'm very glad to be here to join constituents and members of the party, constituents of St. Michael Southeast and members of the party. Psychologists know a word called gaslighting. <laughs> and you hear it very often though it is. It is a form of psychological abuse in which the abuser digs unrelentingly at your self-confidence tries to get you to believe that the things that you are seeing, you are not really seeing. The things that you are hearing are not real. Your experiences are a figment of your imagination. And as the abuser digs at your self-confidence, eventually, when you are captured, you then become wholly dependent on the abuser and you are available for that abuser's manipulation. Now, I give that background because a lot of gaslighting has been taking place in Barbados over the last six years in relation to the Democratic Labour Party. And unfortunately, a lot of us has, have fallen for it and have fallen victim to it so that all the things that we know about ourselves we no longer recognize and we only recognize what we are told about ourselves and told by people who do not necessarily wish us well but who just want to manipulate us for their own purposes. For example, that losing elections was something new. We lost the 2018 election and we lost the mock election in 2022. And we are given to believe 
that this is something exceptional. This should never have happened. Now, if I may go to the United Kingdom for a short while, the British Conservative Party just lost the, the general election there. Their worst defeat in 192 years. They were winning elections routinely in England from 1832. And on the 4th of July this year, they experienced their worst electoral defeat in 192 years. Of course, just five years ago, they won a thumping majority against the Labour Party in England, which five years ago experienced its worst defeat since 1935. And now today, it is the government with over 400 seats and, and um, having subjected the Conservative Party that defeated it five years ago to that defeat. I, I give that background because this is what happens in what we call democratic societies. You win elections, you lose them. But because you win them or lose them does not mean that anything exceptional has happened because this is the process. But some, for some strange reason after 2018, I was getting the impression that something unprecedented had happened in Barbados and that the Democratic Labour Party should be ashamed we should all walk around in a state of dazed disorientation. We should be afraid to, afraid to look in anybody's face, and so on. And that was the version of ourselves that we were being asked to accept, and quite frankly, that a lot of us accepted. And the gaslighting was so effective that in many respects we still accept it. Let me tell you two important things about the, about the DLP. I don't, I cannot possibly be contradicted on what I'm going to say now because what I'm going to say to you now is unchallengeably factual. Barbadians got the vote, all Barbadians got the vote in 1951, the same year in which I was born that Pedro referred to. That was called universal adult suffrage. Every Barbadian who was an adult at age 21 could vote from the year 1951. And between 1951 and the last election we won, which was in 2013, we had 14 general elections in Barbados. Between 1951 and the last election we won in Barbados in 2013, there were 14 general elections in Barbados. Since then, we had the 2018 one and the 2022, and therefore there no, have now been 16 general elections in Barbados since universal adult suffrage, since 1951. When we won the 2013 election, the 14th election since universal adult suffrage, of those
those 14 elections, the Democratic Labour Party had won seven, 50%, and the Barbados Labour Party had won seven, also 50%. So there was no superiority there or inferiority. Both parties had won seven elections and lost seven. The second point I will make is this. In, 19, in 2018, when we came out of government, we were 63 years old as a party. We're now 69 because this is six years later. But when in 2018, when we lost, we were 63 years old as a party. And of those 63 years, we spent 33 years in government. In other words, more than half of the 62. So we won seven of the 14 general elections up to 2013. And we spent 33 of the 63 years we were around in 2018. When we're 69 now, we have still spent 33 years in government, but 33 of 69. What about a record like that should anybody be ashamed of? You can't want for a more impressive record than that. Let me tell you something. The British Labour Party was formed in 1900. They're 124 years old now. I would like you to go and check to see if they have spent 33 years in government yet. We spent 33 years in government from 69 years of existence. They are 124 years old. I want you to go and check to see whether they get to 33 yet. Because I just, as I said to you earlier, the, 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 the governing Conservative Party, what, what, in fact, it, is so, it, is, it was so accustomed to winning the elections that you constantly refer to, even when it is not governing, you call it the governing Conservative Party because it's the natural governing party of, our, of, our, of the United Kingdom. So, I am here to tell you this evening that we need to get back to the real version of ourselves. We have not been relating to the real version of ourselves. And we need to get back to the real Democratic Labour Party. The Democratic Labour Party that spent 33 years of its existence in government and that won seven of the last 16 elections in Barbados. And if we were to win the next election, that would be the 17th election. We would be eight out of 17. And if you win the one after that, get two terms, as is normally the case, that would be the 18th, and we would be back to 50% again, 9 out of 18. There's nothing in that record of which to be ashamed. So when people come and say, oh, no, if you continue doing the same things in the same way, you can and expect a different outcome, something wrong with you, what have we been doing in the same way over and over again, and expecting a different outcome. We've been doing the right thing because we have been performing more creditably than most other political parties anywhere in the Caribbean, and certainly 
outside of the Caribbean. As I said to you, the British Labour Party is 124 years old. And you can check to see how many years of that, of that 124 they're spent in government. They're in government now, they won the election on the 4th of July. And we have to wait and see how long that will last. We wish them well. But the Conservative Party suffered its worst defeat in 192 years in that last election. And that real version of ourselves that I'm asking you to get back to did not come by magic. It came by hard work, by the discipline and commitment of our founders and the, and the persons who bequeathed this organization to us. Your takeaway from here this evening is going to be about eight P's. You can hear something about power. You can hear about politics first, then about power. Then about party. Then about philosophy. Then about policy. Then about program. Then about priorities. And then about projections. All P's. Eight of them. Because it is on the basis of those eight P's that we have been able to build the record that I just told you about. And it is because we have tended to deviate from those P's that we are now caught up in a lot of interpersonal strife, which really carries us nowhere. And we, we are caught up in a belief, a false belief, that you can unite an organization around an individual. You can't. You unite organizations around values and principles. Personalities change. Principles don't. And that is what has to be recognized. So let's get to our first P. Now, Erskine Sandiford, the late Erskine Sandiford, delivered the first election broadcast for the Democratic Labour Party in the 1971 general election. And he began the broadcast with these words. Politics is about power. and the uses to which power can be put in a society. Politics is about power and the uses to which that power can be put in a society. But then he went on to make the point that even though that is so, even though that is a correct definition of politics, and that is all politics has ever been, is been about power and how power is used. That was so during the days of the Old Testament politicians like King Saul and Jehoshaphat and Solomon and David and Rehoboam and Jeroboam and all of them. All those Old Testament politicians concentrated on how to use power for whose benefit in what way power should be used. Don't, let it, don't get confused that their names turned up in the Bible. They were the Old Testament politicians. They were the ones who ruled societies and determined what happened and what did not happen. But Erskine went, went, went a step further. He said, yes, it is true that politics is about power and the uses to which power can be put in a society. But the Democratic Labour Party has taken a side. We don't just believe that politics is about power and the uses to which it can be put in a society. We have decided, 
Erskine said back then, that politics, yes, is about power, but it is about using that power to lift those at the bottom from where they are to a higher state in the society. And for years after that, DLP spokesmen have put it this way, that we have not come to confirm the mighty in their seats. We have come to exalt the humble and the meek. That, that, is how, that is how we have determined that power should be used. Not leave it out there in the stratosphere can be used for how it can be used in the society. We took a side that it should be used to lift the people at the bottom from where they are to some higher state in the society. And our policies between 1961 and 1966, equalizing pay for men and women at the workplace, introduction of free secondary education, introduction of, yes. of uh, a school meals program, and so on, and a preparing of the country for independence. Yes. That is how we believe power could be used to make people better. Now, so you, can, you cannot separate politics from power and its use. Long before there was anything called a political party, there was something called politics. Political parties came many years later. I believe in ancient Athens, around the 6th or 7th century BC, there were, there were three political parties, one called the Hill Party, represented the people in the hills, one called the Coast Party, representing the people around the coast, and one called the Plains Party, representing the people on the plains. But long before that, there were, there were long before there were those political parties, there was politics, because politics is about power and the use of that power to benefit the least fortunate people in the society. That is the Democratic Labour Party's definition uh, of politics. It's not about having out this with anybody, unless you're doing it over how power should be used. It is not about backstabbing and, and bad-mouthing. It is about the creative use of power to lift people from where they are to put them in a higher and in a better place. And there is no other valid or credible definition of politics anywhere. That is why Cameron Tudor and Errol Barrow and Erskine Sandyford always used to say, you can teach anybody in the world political science, but you can't teach them politics because political science comes from without. Politics comes from within. Politics is about what, how you believe that power should be used in a society. Anybody can be taught political science, but not, you can't teach anybody politics because politics is based on belief and your belief on how power should be used in a society. When you look at how power is being used in a society now, you can come to your own conclusions as to what is this government's definition of politics. You can come to your own conclusions as to who is benefiting from the use of power in Barbados today. I know not the workers. I know not the consumers. Not the people going to the supermarkets. I know that. Not the people who go to the, to the vegetable market. Power is being used to benefit other people elsewhere. So we have 
politics and we have power. You can't separate the two. Then you come to party. Now, <laughs> mass political parties in Barbados, and in the Caribbean for that matter, became an imperative after the disturbances of the 1930s. If you, if you understand that there were, really, there were really masses in fact before the 19, before those disturbances, but those masses did not have any power to choose anybody because they had to satisfy certain property qualifications yes. or certain income qualifications and many of them could not satisfy those qualifications. I like to remind people that the parish from which I, 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 I come had an election in 1940, a very important election. It was the election that brought the late Winter Algernon Crawford to the House of Assembly as the MP for St. Philip. You know how many votes Crawford got in one election? 117 votes. Thousands of people living in St. Philip working in Cane Fields and all over the place. And he got 117 votes and won that election. Why? Because only about 250 people could vote. Only about 250 to 300 people satisfied the income and property qualifications. We know that today all that has changed. But we had political, mass political parties therefore came into existence as a result of those disturbances. And the disturbances happened, of course, of, because of institutional failure in Barbados. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In the 1930s, there were churches here. There was a, there was a state church, in fact. That state church was not the voice of the mass of the people. In fact, the state, that state church now admits that. Back then, we had media, newspapers. That was another institution that existed. That institution, the media, were not the voice of the mass of the people in Barbados. We had a police force. That police force was not an instrument in the hands of the mass of the people of Barbados. We had law courts, but those law courts were not instruments in the hands of the mass of the people to guarantee their liberation. In fact, one of the ironies of life in Barbados today is that in the 1930s, well, let me put it this way, in the 2020s, the same people who are going to prison are the ones who are going to prison in the 1930s. There has been no change in that area of our national life. So even though these institutions existed, none of them was a voice for the voiceless in Barbados. It isn't to say we didn't have them, they were there. We had churches, we had newspapers, we had police force, we had law courts, and there were other institutions, but they did not reflect the interests of the mass of the people in this country. They were not the voice of the voiceless. So the disturbances happened. The Mine Commission report was done. And coming out of all of that, two institutions emerged that were supposed to become the voice 
of the people. The mass political party and the trade union. And upon those two institutions, very ordinary Barbadians depended or have depended from then until now. I don't know how much they can depend on trade unions now. <laughs> but the partnership between the partnership between governments and the trade union movement, that social partnership was the partnership that did the most good for Barbados and for other Caribbean countries since the 1930s. And they both had the same target within sight, the merchants and the planters. Both the governments and the trade unions and the mass, well, the mass political parties, the government and the trade unions had the merchants and the planters within sight. Well, of course, we don't have, the planters are gone now. The sugar industry has basically disappeared. We don't have a merchant planter elite in Barbados anymore. We now have a merchant hospitality elite. And that merchant hospitality elite, we can tell you this, have now replaced the planters. And if you watch what is happening in that sector, you can see what beckons for the future. But to be fair, for a while, the political parties and the trade unions did what they were supposed to do. And Barbadians benefited. For example, in our, in our 1961 manifesto, because of our relationship with the trade union, we, we amended the trade union act to, to, to allow for peaceful picketing, something as simple as that. And against the wishes of the trade unions and against the wishes of of the employers, the government that I led, of which Maxime was a member, we passed the Employment Rights Act <laughs> to ensure that the interests and the rights of workers were protected. Now, I, I, you know, I want you to pay attention to what is happening in Barbados because since this regime came to office, the present Minister of Labor, Mr. Colin Jordan, was reported in the newspaper as saying that the Employment Rights Act has to be amended because it is too partial to workers. Now, a Minister of Labor is saying that a piece of labor legislation favor favors workers too much. You understand that? I took him up on it in this very room when it was last here. And they have retreated into the background, but something else is happening. Because they intend to get rid of that legislation. Let me tell you what is happening now. The Employment Rights Tribunal, the last chairman of that tribunal was the gentleman who is now the chairman of the Constitution Review Commission, the Republican Constitution. They have not replaced it, a, a, the chairman of the Employment Rights Tribunal since he resigned, and cases are piling up. So eventually you will hear that the whole thing has become non-functional, and you may as well get rid of the whole thing. The first chairman of that tribunal sits, in, sits here in the front of this audience, Al Gala. Did the yeoman service for that tribunal, set it off on, <laughs> set it off on the right course. But now, it is laying dormant. 
because the truth is the employers didn't want that legislation and the unions didn't want it either. And I said, I told the then Minister of Labor, Dr. Esther Baez-Saku, we are going to Parliament and passing this law. If it has to be amended any time, we'll do that because that happens to all legislation. But I am not leaving the office of Prime Minister of Barbados unless the Employment Rights Act is on the statute. <laughs> so, political parties, therefore, became part of the national outfit, the national governance outfit. Parties have their rules, they have their methods of organization, people join them, support them, and so on, and sustain them because of how important they have been to the lives of people across Barbados and in other Caribbean countries as well. So you have, you heard about politics, and power, party. Now you can say a lot more about party because, because so much is happening in our party at the moment. I can say a lot about that, but there's a time and a place for everything. <laughs> party conference is next week. And I will let sleeping dogs lie for the time being. But I will say this, that um, for the last 69 years, those of us associated with the DLP can be proud of the work it has done for Barbados. <laughs> That is the version of ourselves that we must promote. We must not fall victim to the gaslighting that is happening around Barbados. This stupid talk about, oh, the DLP is dead, you know. We, we are now toast. A lot of foolishness. That's like, that, is, that is as mad as, as saying that the British Conservative Party that was running, winning almost every election in Britain for the last 192 years, that they are toast because they just had the worst defeat. It is foolishness. The DLP rests on an infrastructure of principles, and those principles have sustained us from way back then until now. And the truth is, and I said this, it's a matter for regret that my, my words were not taken as seriously as they should have been at the time. I said, after we lost in 2008, I said, we are not in search of any savior. We lost the 1956 election. We lost the 1976 election. We lost the 1981 election. We lost the 94, the 99, and the 2003. We know how to deal with defeats. We don't need any savior, any messiah to come from anywhere to show us how to deal with defeat. But because of the gaslighting that had taken place, because our confidence was systematically dug at and overwhelmed, we still went in search of a messiah. And he came, <laughs> and he came, and from what I heard over the last few days, he's now left. <laughs> and we still, have, we still have to do the work that we should have been doing from the very beginning. I think it is a matter for regret, to be quite honest with you, that the party has rules, and those who want to administer the affairs of the party 
who feel that they have a right to administer the affairs of the party, do not think that they are bound by the rules. If the police charge you with an offense, you may know that you did not commit the offense. But you know something? When you are summoned to court, you have to go and present evidence. Present evidence to convince the court that you did not do it. And you clear your name. That is the procedure. And I hear a lot of talk. I mean, I'm, I'm not getting to any disputes now because I, I came here for a different purpose. But I hear talk about getting people to raise up at a party conference. Let me tell you something. Nobody can cherry pick the rules in the Democratic Labour Party's constitution that they, the ones that they are going to obey, the ones by which they feel bound, and the ones that they can reject. They're in a right of appeal. I, I am the person who chaired the committee that revised the Democratic Labour Party's constitution in 1996. That committee was made up of myself as chairman, Erskine Sandiford, and an attorney at law, Douglas Greenwich. And I made sure that certain things were in that constitution because in times of peace, you have to prepare for war. And you never know what you're going to end up with. So nobody can cherry pick and say, OK, I feel bound by these rules, but you see them, I ain't not doing them. You either subscribe to the principles contained in the party's constitution, all of them, or none. It's a zero something, either all or none. So the political party has served, the DLP as the political party has served Barbados mightily well. And it's a party of which we can all feel proud. It's the party, I, I, I talked about what happened between 61 and 66. Between 66 and 71, we had National Insurance and Social Security Act passed to benefit every household in Barbados. We had the severance payment legislation passed to benefit workers across Barbados. We passed a Barbados Development Bank Act because we had an industrial policy that basically said, look, there may be young men, young women who want to start businesses but don't have the startup capital and don't have the accounting and other, and other managerial advice and so on available to them. So we set up a bank that they could, through, through which they could access funds, the Barbados Development Bank, and through which they could get the kind of advice and guidance that they needed in their uh, industrial and other activities. I, I don't have to tell you that the people who borrowed most of the money and won't pay it back did not come from the Democratic Labour Party. And eventually, the Barbados Labour Party repealed the legislation setting up the Barbados Development Bank, the ONAF administration, and the Barbados Development Bank was accorded a decent burial. So we had politics, we had power, we had party. And now we come to philosophy. It is because of the party's philosophy that it got the guidance it needed over its entire life to carry Barbados in the direction 
which it carried in those 33 years that we were in government. The word philosophy sounds like a big word sometimes. It is not. Your philosophy is your outlook on the world, your worldview, how you see the world, what you think are the fundamentals that make up the elements of human existence. Um, by the way, every single person in this room, whether he or she knows it or not, lives according to a philosophy. Every person who has ever come through this room has lived by a philosophy. All the people that you have ever known have lived their lives, their lives according to a philosophy. And all the ones that you and me yet are living their lives according to a philosophy. Because there's no human being who in his life or in his or her life doesn't operate daily on the basis of the answers to three important questions. What is it possible for me to know? How do I get to know it? And when I get to know what it is possible to know, what do I do with that knowledge? All of us, every day, confront those questions and live by them. All philosophy is concerned about is with knowledge and how it is acquired. Now, as a result of those questions, we've had all kinds of divisions in the world between various types of philosophies. Even a babe, even a babe, even a, a toddler understands those questions. The toddler who says the cat is on the mat is saying two things. There's something called a cat, and there's something called a mat. How, does, how do you know that? Mommy or daddy, looky there. In other words, I can see it. And if you want more proof, I can go and take him up and feel him. I can touch the mat too. So I get my knowledge through the senses, through my, my five senses. And depending on whether I like the cat on the mat or not, depending on, on, the, on the, the manner in which I say the cat is on the mat, I either approve of the cat being there or I don't. That is how I determine how I will use the knowledge of the cat being on the mat uh, in that experience. Every human being goes through that every day. Everyone. As I said, that has led to all kinds of divisions in philosophy, all the big names and so on. We have People who, people who believe in materialist philosophy, who believe in idealist philosophy, who, who are rationalists, who believe that, that um, reason is the, the best route to knowledge. Then we have the empiricists who believe that all your knowledge comes through a gateway called your five senses. Then you have the pragmatists in the United States who believe that you know something is knowledge and, and, and useful because of its cash value. So when you ask the question, what is in this for me now, and there's something in it, that means it's, it's knowledge, it's right, and if there ain't nothing in it, that means it ain't knowledge, it's wrong. And we see that among the pragmatists, and so on. You also had a school called the, the Positivists, and I was very pleased when I read the report of the Commission on, on Law and Order done by Roy Marshall, the late Roy Marshall and, and, and others, that he mentioned positivism and the, its impact on how people live. 
Because one of the things about the positivists, uh, they were a little school that developed in Austria, the logical positivists. And um, they believed that something could only be true if you could verify it, a principle of verification. If you couldn't verify it, it was not true. And that led them to the conclusion that there was nothing called ethics. Because if a man tells you something is wrong, but you can't prove it, that's your opinion. If he tells you it's right, you can't prove that either. Because that's only your opinion. So they came to the conclusion that ethics, right and wrong and so on, are just matters of what they call hooray and boo. If I agree with you, hooray. If I disagree with you, boo. But since ethic, ethical issues cannot be empirically verified, you can't prove them, as far as they were concerned, waste of time. And on and on that went. But the DLP developed the philosophy. We said we were democratic socialists, and of course, when we said so, by that we meant, and I, I have here an interview that was done with Errol Barra in August 1977, an interview it was published in the Bulletin of Eastern Caribbean Affairs out of the Institute of Social and Economic Research at KFIL. And the, the first question he was asked was, what are the main components of democratic socialism as your party practices it? And Barry's answer was, minimum standards of nourishment and shelter and the ready availability of all the amenities of life to the total population below which no one should be allowed to fall. And that includes education. It's a whole long interview. Interestingly enough, there was a response to it, also published by a leftist group in Barbados at the time. But that philosophy, that view of the world, also required us to have a concept of development. What kind of Barbados is it that we want to create? That is what I mean by the concept of development. Now, you don't hear the word development much nowadays. You hear growth. And as I've often said, Growth doesn't answer all the questions. Growth can tell you how much the pig weighed last year <laughs> and how much he weighed this year. But it can't tell uh, when, he when, he, when he's killed who can get a piece of the pork. So you hear a lot about growth. So we, we, you've been hearing recently, oh, the economy is growing by this amount and by that amount. And it's not being felt by anybody going in the supermarket. It's not being felt by anybody receiving an electricity bill. It is not being felt by those who have to use public transport. But we're hearing about all this growth. And that is why it is important that we get past the concept of growth and begin to look at a concept of development which the Democratic Labour Party has always done. There was a man in the 1920s called Dudley Sears, who, he was a development economist, and he said that, um, you know that you're experiencing development if consistently you are seeing a reduction in poverty, in inequality, and in unemployment. That was the series. 
our own William DeMass, who is to be Secretary General of the CARICOM here, and who is also President of the Caribbean Development Bank, DeMass argued, he wrote, he wrote a, a chapter on the concept of development, and he, he argued that you know that you are developing when there is a consistent improvement in the well-being, the material well-being of your citizens. He said, there must be a fair distribution of income. There must be constantly reducing unemployment. and a consistent improvement in the material well-being of your citizens. And of course, Damas also went one step further and said, look, if all this is happening but somebody outside of your country is determining all of this, it means that your development doesn't depend on you. And at any time, that tap can be turned off. And then one of the tidiest articles on this subject I have read um, I read from a local economist, Alfred Wendell Audley McLean, written in 1979. And McLean, McLean gave a very good definition of development, he said that you, you, you are certain that you are developing or that you have developed when you have developed the capacity, that word, and the flexibility, that word, the capacity and the flexibility to respond to the diverse aspirations of the people in your society. And amongst those aspirations, he numbered the aspiration to be employed, the aspiration to have decent work, the aspiration to enjoy equality, equality of opportunity in the society. And he too, like Damas, argued that in addition to doing all those things, your, your development should stem from decision making inside of your country and not outside of it. Very good paper written by Wendell McLean that many years ago. As I said, nowadays you don't hear the word development much. You hear a lot about growth, and growth hides a lot of things. Um, you hear the economy has grown by 4%, but that is nothing on which any trade union can rely to go and ask for any increase in wages. So that is, that is how that happens. So as a result of the, of the philosophy of the party and our constant development, we've been able to steer Barbados in a definitive direction. Errol Barrow, though, makes the point that the development with which we are concerned, the development with which we here in Barbados are concerned and, we, which, and with which the Democratic Labour Party is concerned, is social and economic in quantity, but is personal and human in quality. So that no matter what figures or whatever else you, you put out there, people must feel it. People must feel all that you say is happening. If it is not personal and if it's not human, it is not development as far as the Democratic Labour Party is concerned. And that was Barrow's view. 
I remember during the by-election we had, I brought Richie Haynes to the House of Assembly. One night in Britain Hill, around just about one in the morning, Errol Barrow was invited to speak. And he began his speech by saying, look, it is one o'clock in the morning. I spent most of my political life being accused of talking too much history and talking too much philosophy. Those of you who don't want to hear any history or philosophy are free to leave now <laughs> because that is what I'm going to talk. Because if you don't know where you came from, you can't know where you are or where you're going. And if you don't have a philosophy, you have nothing to guide you to ensure that you are properly steered and going to the right destination. So the Democratic Labour Party has a version of itself based on that as well. And um, so we've, we've, we've done politics, we've done power, we've done party, we've looked at philosophy. And that philosophy, of course, always leads us to ensure that power is being used for the benefit and the upliftment of the people who need it most. And you only have to look at what is happening in Barbados today to understand the importance of all of this because the people who are benefiting from the way power is being used in Barbados today are not the people who need it most. And then quickly, this policy. Your next P, policy. Policy is guided and it's connected to all that I said before, the policies with which we have come up are all based on our philosophy, and all also based on how we believe that power should be used. I'll give you an example of that. We had a policy that the lands of plantation tenants should be acquired and transferred to the tenants. That policy is contained in our 1961 manifesto. The truth is that at the time when we articulated the policy, there was an acute shortage of land surveyors in Barbados. Any, any, any surveyors plan you took up either had on the name Graham Giddens or Darrell Gomez. <laughs> there were very few land surveyors in Barbados, maybe one or two other names. Um, but so land surveyors had to be trained first before we could uh, deal with that issue. We did not get a chance to implement that policy because it was implemented by the other side. And nothing wrong with that. We supported it when it was implemented because it was a good policy. Um, so if, if you're consistent on policy, it really doesn't matter whether you do the implementing or whether your adversary does it. You support it because good policy is good policy. And we always believed that plantation tenants were entitled to own the lots that they were on. We were not able to move from policy to program, which is your next P, because, as I said, we didn't have the requisite manpower, surveying manpower, to do the the huge volume of work that would have had to be done to get the policy through. So outside of policy then, the actual implementation comes through your, your next P, which is your programs. Where we now live and operate in an environment where 
the operational model in Barbados now is to put the cart before the horse. <laughs> so you put on your shoes and make sure they're on, and then you start looking around for your socks. But we always made sure that we subjected to prolonged study and to inveterate acquaintance those, those initiatives that we wanted to move from policy to programs for implementation. That is why we did that with nursery education when we were last in office. We also did it with the reforms in education that we introduced. Now, I took the position, and the Minister of Education, and other members of the Cabinet agreed that you really can't talk about reforming education in Barbados. and leave all the schools where you found them. Do nothing about narrowing the gap between the schools, when in fact one of the most divisive issues in Barbados is the issue of the school tie. Now, we tackle that issue and we tackled it because amongst the many programs that we introduced uh, during our time, during those, those 33 years in government, we built Spring Memorial Secondary School. We opened LSD Secondary School for Independence in 1966. We built St. George Secondary School. We built the Garrison Secondary School. We built St. Lucy Secondary School. We built Dayton Griffith Secondary School. We laid the foundation for the building of St. James Secondary School. We started the St. Thomas Secondary School, but couldn't finish it because of the inflationary conditions uh, arising in the early 1990s. So the Labour Party came in and finished it and named it, no problem. Good policy, and we didn't, we, didn't, we didn't mind that. But we felt that with this whole new educational outfit, we had to narrow the gap between those schools, or some of them, and what were traditionally called the older secondary schools. And we put six form programs in some of those schools. And that those programs remain in place and uh, we feel comforted by all of that because we subjected those, those, those policies to, as I say, prolonged study and to inveterate acquaintance. So, You have your power, you have your, you have your politics, you have your power, you have your party, you have your philosophy, you have your policy, you have your program. Let me come to the priorities. The difference between the Democratic Labour Party and the Barbados Labour Party, very simple. On my way here, I heard a very interesting news item that a new headquarters is going to be built for the Barbados Defense Force in St. George. And um, of course, as if I had forgotten that all that belt of land where St. Anne's Fort now is, is supposed to become 
is supposed to be developed for tourism. So that was not any creative thought coming from anywhere. It was always that part of the bargain was to get, you have to give up that land for tourism development, so I find somewhere to put the defense force. And we are now told, based on what I heard on my way here, that the defense force is going into St. George. No plan yet. Well, the, 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 cart, the cart has now moved ahead. The horse will come later. The horse will come later. Um, I, I'm not surprised by any of this. We have always, as a party, concentrated on the smaller and more personal and more human projects in Barbados. We build schools because we know that every, ho every household in Barbados benefits from a school either directly or indirectly. These big, grandiose things, uh, you know, we, we, we've always steered clear of all of that. Granny Adams did the harbor, nothing very good. Errol Barr did the airport there, it was, it was not open by us, but it was built by us. Uh, and named, it was named by the, by the Labour Party, but built by us. I think the last major physical development project the Labour Party did, and that we are still paying for, I know that the payments are supposed to come to an end in 2033, in the prison. Well, while we are busy building schools, they're busy building prisons. The late Gordon Matthews has gone to his grave, an angry man, because he said that had the then minister listened to him, Glenderry would not have broken down, would not, would not have been burnt down, because he kept warning that something was happening up there, because he was, he was connected with up there, and nobody listened to him. And, um, but the interesting thing about that period was that once it got burnt down, media personnel began to praise the then minister for how, how well she conducted her press conferences. Prison burned down, you know. When the body discussing the burnt down prison, it is how well the minister was conducting her press conferences. But in terms of priorities, our priorities are human and personal. And to the extent that any policy or project was to claim our attention and to, to get our acquiescence, we had to be satisfied on the extent to which it was going, it's, positive effects were going to be felt by, by the people in the country. They've always liked the big, splashy thing. I hear some things on the social media that are, that are happening in Barbados. I don't know about you, but I look around. I don't see any of these things happening, but I, I hear these fantastic advertisements about all this development taking place in Barbados, and I don't see it. They've employed some, some woman with a, a, a fascinating voice to tell you these tall stories about all these big things happening in Barbados, and when you look around, you can't see any evidence of it at all. But it comes down to this, when it comes to priorities. When you go to the supermarket, there will always be in the supermarket people who can afford to buy more than you can afford to buy. And there will be people who cannot afford to buy as much as you can afford to buy. 
when you go to the gas station, the same thing happens. There are people who can afford to tell the gas to turn up, fill me up. The fellow who just wants to make it home, so give me $20 there. And you may be somewhere in between there. There are always persons who can do better than you and people who can't do as well as you. But let me tell you what the good news is. Let me tell you what is the, what I call the equilibrating element in all of this. What applies in the supermarket or what applies at the gas, the gas station does not apply in the polling booth. No matter how wealthy a man is, no matter how poor a man or woman is, their vote carries the same weight. And that is why Rich people don't like to see poor people voting. Because the idea that their vote carries the same weight as mine does not appeal to them at all. And therefore, that is one of the principal reasons we have to ensure that we get past this, this unfortunate tendency to say we are too angry to vote. I am bothering to vote. Your vote equates to driving a vehicle and your hand being on the steering wheel. If you take your hands off the steering wheel, you cannot be heard to complain about where the vehicle goes, <laughs> wherever it ends up, wherever it ends up, you have to be you have to be happy, happy about. So in terms of our priorities, we continue to be personal and human, but we also want to ensure that people understand their importance in the the whole scheme of things, in, in the, the entire scheme of, scheme of things scheme in Barbados. Our priorities are not the grandiose, blinding um, projects. We do them, we do them. They create jobs and provide employment and so on, but our concept of development Personal and human. Social and economic in quantity, but personal and human in quality. And I said my last P was going to be projection. Um, I said projection because we didn't want to keep all of this for ourselves here in Barbados. So in, on the 27th of June, 1965, Errol Barrow wrote a letter to Forbes Burnham of Ghana saying, look, you know, we have to take the Caribbean to another level and I would like you to come to Barbados in a week's time. Let's talk this thing through. And they did that. They had the conversation. As a result of that conversation, uh, the, the decision was taken to establish a, a Caribbean free trade area, which later matured into what we know as CARICOM today, so that the presence of the Democratic Labour Party has been felt not only here in Barbados, but across the Caribbean as well. And we have a lot to be proud about in that regard. So, the version of who we are, the, the, the real version of who we are, is all that I just said to, to, to you this evening. We, we got to where we are, 33 years in government, out of 69 years of existence, seven elections won, out of 
by 16 now, but the last two, this 2018 election, there, there will be questions that will be, will be answered about that in the fullness of time and the mock election of 2022. We can forget that. But that's the real version of, 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 of who we are. And that is the version that must now take center stage with our new leader, our new political leader, Ralph Thorn. You know, there's a, well, there has been a flourishing industry in the Democratic Labour Party. It really flourishes. And it goes back to 1994, the month of September. That industry is called taking the name of Randall Stewart in vain. So whenever you can't find who to blame for anything, you can't go wrong if you blame Randall Stewart. That industry has really flourished over time. So not surprisingly, when Mr. Thorne came over to the Democratic Labour Party, the person who was blamed and is being blamed is your humble servant, even now. All right. By the way, I am not ashamed of that. I have known Ralph Thorne. I met Ralph Thorne in 1982. And he wouldn't law school in Trinidad. And we developed a friendship way back then. And that friendship subsists to this day. When Ralph Thorne did his legal training, his in-service training, he did his in-service training with attorney at law, our own Morris Atherston King. And he's had a very distinguished practice as a lawyer, both here in Barbados and in other parts of the Caribbean, particularly Ghana, where he and uh, my colleague and friend Hal Gallup have done some, remark from, some remarkable work for the, the government of Ghana. Ralph, let me say no, has the character, the capacity, and the courage. Those three C's, character, capacity, and courage, to be not only the political leader of the Democratic Labour Party, but whatever else flows from that. All the years I've known him, in Ralph Anthony Thorne, I've never found any guile. Very rounded and well-read man. He, he and I shared a, a very precious friend among us, or between us, the late George Lamin, who on whose considerable authority and wisdom we were both able to draw over the years. And Ralph ran on the Democratic Labour Party's platform in 1994. He spoke on my platform in St. Martin, St. Philip. I spoke on his, his platform in Eden Lodge. And that process 
was repeated in 1900 and 99. I do not, I said he was a man of character, he has the character. I better say what I mean by character though. The English word character comes from a Greek word character, which means an impress or a stamp or an engraving. Could even mean a scratch sometimes. And when I say that Ralph has the character to be the political leader for the Democratic Labour Party and anything else that flows from that, I, I intend to say no more than that. Wherever he goes, anything he touches, he leaves his impress, his, impress, his stamp. <laughs> and I think that we are the better off for having him. Yeah. I, I hope that coming out of meetings like this, I better not say this meeting, but coming out of meetings like this, that we'll get past the old childish and silly personal debates and get around to dealing with the real version of ourselves. If one person voted for us in 2022, one person, we owe that person a duty for sticking their neck out and standing with us in a difficult situation. And there are people out there who are waiting on us to put their case. There are some who have repented their errors and are ready for a change from what we have now. And we cannot even appear to be obstructing them in that quest. I think that we now have to determine to rally behind the political leader of the party and let us get on with the serious work that has to be done. Let us stop subscribing to all of the, the misleading narratives about the Democratic Labour Party and what it is and what it means and what it, We have a real version of ourselves and I shared it or attempted to share it with, with you here this evening under a peace and the time has come for us to turn the corner now. Enough of the, of the pettiness and the childishness. I, I, you have not, but the word, the word urinal <laughs> does not begin with P. But anybody who wants to boast that they did so much for the DLP because they put in urinals, <laughs> I, I've never been a wealthy man. I've never been a wealthy man. But if urinals are the problem, or painting an auditorium is the problem, I am prepared to make myself responsible for replacing the urinals. <laughs> Give them back their urinals, and I, I will make myself responsible for that. And not only, not only that, not only that, if they also want, if they also want the toilet bowl, I will make myself responsible for replacing that too. I'm not a wealthy man, but I will do that. On one condition though, that 
that a precondition to that kind of parting is that we, would, we must have photographers posted at the entrance of the Democratic Labour Party so that when they're going through the gate with them on their shoulders, <laughs> photographs can be taken and we can get on with our business. But we have to get past this. Politics is about power and the use of that power to lift people up. It's not about these frivolous debates. And in conclusion, let me say this. My real conclusion now. Because all of us have to be concerned about the wasteland in which we are now living called Barbados. Where nothing is working. If you got a you got a pretty garbage can, but you can't get in the garbage trucks. <laughs> you can't afford what's in the supermarket. Light bills frightening you. I heard the anguish voice of a woman on the calling program this week carrying on about the floor telephone bill she got. I thought she was going to I thought she was going to 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 to, to have a cardiac arrest. She was so agitated about all that. The wasteland features about all of this. And we have to rise to the occasion. T.S. Eliot, the poet, Thomas Stearns Eliot, wrote a, wrote a poem called The Wasteland. And he asked some very pertinent questions. He asked, in this wasteland, having settled all the things that were wrong and so on, he said, but what are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? He went on, son of man, you cannot say or guess. Because you know only a heap of broken images where the sun beats. The dead tree gives no shelter. The cricket, no relief. And the dry stone, no sound of water. That is our wasteland. And it is time that the Democratic Labour Party now rises up to prove that anybody who got a certain amount of votes should not be got rid of by fewer, fewer than that number of votes. If that argument were correct, I know that our concerned if we got nearly 4,000 votes in St. Michael South in the 1991 general election, and 16 people in the House of Assembly brought him down in a no-confidence motion. But we have to get past all of this and get on with the business of real politics, which is about power and how power is being used in the society. So thanks again for having me. Thanks for your patience. And um, I look forward. I look forward to being around. Thank you very much.